We're on. Okay. And welcome back. Uh, this panel will be all with teachers. Uh, I just wanted to say, make sure you get your buttons and your postcards. And there's even bumper stickers. Swag. Get swag. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mira Debs, who runs the Education Studies Program here at Yale. Uh, <laughs> so I just to you downstairs, or upstairs. Mira, it's all yours. Thank you so much, David. Um, uh, I'm, as David mentioned, my name is Mira Debs. I am a former high school uh, world and US history teacher from uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and now it's my honor to direct the education studies program at Yale, where I work with um, a huge number of really amazing Yale students who want to be involved in education. Many of them want to be teachers um, and uh, doing exciting work to continue building this program at Yale. Um, it's been really fabulous being part of the process of helping to design uh, this conference together with David and Michelle and many others. Um, and as we were planning the conference, we wanted this to not only be um, historians uh, talking to an audience, a, a public audience, but an audience including many high, high school teachers, um, but we also wanted it to be a space where the teachers were then presenting back to the historians um, and, in and very much in conversation throughout um, with historians. Um, so today is the first of um, two panels where we will be hearing from teachers. Um, and I'm really delighted by the array of uh, different teachers that we have who are, are participating in the panel today. Um, I also have as a moderator with me, um, Edie Abraham Mott, who uh, graduated from Yale this past year. Uh, she was a, an American studies major and uh, education studies uh, scholar in our program. Um, and for that program, she wrote a, a capstone paper called Critical Race Theory Debates Through History and Through Teacher's Eyes. And in the course of um, collecting these interviews, she, she conducted interviews with a lot of teachers around the country who were um, involved in CRT debates. And so um, Edie has been really integral to helping to plan um, this particular panel and will be co-moderating it with me. Um, so let me quickly introduce the folks who you're going to be hearing from um, today, and then I'll get out of the way and turn things over to Edie and to the teachers. Um, so our, our first um, speaker is uh, Deja, Brave, Deja Brabham. Am I saying that right? Okay, great. Um, who's a high school teacher at Windsor High School in Windsor, Connecticut, and a, a member of the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective, which is a consortium of students, uh, teachers, uh, Yale faculty, and Yale students. Um, so Deja is a public historian, curriculum writer, and educator. She currently teaches at Windsor High School and Southern Connecticut State University here in New Haven, um, and is a member of the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective. She has worked to make black and brown histories accessible throughout her career. In 2018, she worked with the Yale New Haven Teachers Institute to publish a curriculum on teaching race in law. She was also awarded a Fulbright for her master's at the Royal Holloway University of London in public history and expanding her internship homegoing in which students learn about and produce stories about Afro diasporic histories. Um, we also have um, on this panel Anthony Crawford, who's an English teacher from Millwood High School in Oklahoma City. Um, he's currently en route. His flight was delayed. Um, so uh, we hope he'll be able to join us um, for this panel. And if that doesn't happen, um, we will hopefully have a chance to hear from him tomorrow. Um, uh, but let me just give his brief introduction that he's an edu educator, artist, poet, and a host and filmmaker and a public speaker author of three books, which can all be found on amazon.com. So you can start Googling it right now. Um, and his highest honor is being father to Akira Crawford. Um, next to Deja, we have Chris Dyer, um, who's a history teacher at Ben Franklin High School in New Orleans. He's the 2020 Louisiana Teacher of the Year. And a finalist for National Teacher of the Year. We really, I mean, these events should really be celebrated much like we should know about these more than the Miss America pageants. Um, and uh, the Gilder 2021 Gilder Lehman Louisiana Teacher of the Year. His pedagogical scholarship and his student advocacy have been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, Politico, and he's appeared on NPR, CBS, the CBC, 
and CNN. He's also the author of the 1868 St. Bernard Parish Massacre, published by the History Press. Dyer has two master's degrees from the University of New Orleans and is currently pursuing a PhD in curriculum development. Sounds like you are very busy. I <laughs> um, And uh, finally, I'm so delighted to be bringing back uh, Leila Trehoff Dali, uh, who is a Yale College graduate of 2017. Um, I am officially old enough to have had um, graduating students come back for their five year reunions. And so um, Layla was in a, a course with me and it's been such an honor to see her go out in the world and, and begin her teaching career. Um, she's a fifth and sixth grade reading and writing teacher at Bronzeville Classical School in Chicago. So really glad that we have elementary school representation on this panel. She focuses on helping children develop robust reading lives and empowering students to publish their writing to make their voices heard. She previously taught at Claremont STEM Academy where she received a 1.5 million Chicago City Works grant from the city to build a playground research designed and presented by students. She also raised money to purchase a culturally relevant classroom library that now contains over 900 books. She is a 2022-2023 Teach Plus Illinois Policy Fellow focusing on legislation to improve statewide early literacy. She earned her BA in history from Yale and MIT from the Urban Teachers Education Program at the University of Chicago and her ESL teaching credential from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, and lastly, I just want to say when I um, first I was out in Chicago visiting with Layla in fall of 2019 in her first year of teaching. At that point, she came directly from the picket line. She was dressed all in red. So her first fall of teaching was the Chicago teachers strike. <laughs> Then her subsequent spring of teaching was the pandemic. Um, so, you know, my hat off to all of the teachers for, for persevering and especially for someone new to the field. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming all these extraordinary teachers to our conversation. Thank you all so much again for being here. I'm really excited that I get to help moderate. Okay, um, I was wondering if you could start off by just telling us a little bit about how you decided to become a teacher, what motivated you, maybe in the specific subject area that you teach in. Whoever wants to. I think we Okay. Um, first of all, I'm sorry my voice is still first. My students have already told me I sound like Mickey Mouse, so I'm really sorry. Um, but this things happen. Um, so um, I um, didn't always know that I wanted to be a teacher, although um, in fifth grade I dressed up as of my school. Um, I made a full model of my school, and I met my grandma who was here really showed seeing the writing on the wall. Um, but I uh, I started working in a music therapy program with students with special needs when I was a kid myself when I was 13, and I did that all through high school. And at the same time, I was attending a New York City uh, specialized high school um, where the debates over race and equity were just beginning. Um, and so I came to Yale knowing I was interested in education and thinking I might want to do policy work. Um, and I thought, oh, I'll just spend a summer in a school and that will be enough for me to, to know what it's like in the schools. Um, and I received the Kirchner Fellowship and um, was so fortunate to work at an elementary school in Fairhaven over the summer, during the summer program. I got to be with kids and teachers in the afternoon and then in the morning and then shadow administrators in the afternoon. And I was so lucky to do this because I learned one that um, going into policy without being in the classroom for several years will leave you a pretty um, shallow understanding. It's very complex. And more importantly, I learned that I was in love with teaching. Um, and so um, the other thing is that, so I, I teach reading and writing currently in my previous position. I also taught history. Um, and now I just run a little uh, after school club where I do some of the same history work. Um, but I, one of the things I want to um, submit to you all here is that um, I hate to break it to you, but fifth and sixth graders can do the kind of history work that you all do. Um, and, um, I I liked history a lot in college, uh, uh, in high school. 
Um, but it was very much a, a textbook and take notes kind of situation. And then I came to college and I realized that a lot of the times the, the questions we're discussing, there's no answer to the textbook. Um, and I don't think I relied to um, by my K-12 education. And so I wanted to go back um, and teach students history the way that historians actually did it. Yeah, that's amazing. It's a great way to teach history. So my trajectory is a little different, and this is a fascinating question because it's almost uh, my answer is almost kind of blasphemy, blasphemy, especially in a group like this. But I didn't want to become a history teacher. In fact, it was the last thing that I wanted to do, literally out of all things, because I am the son of a history teacher. <laughs> so I watched my mom, you know, really worked so hard every day to plan these lessons and. You know, to be the best teacher that she could be. She's still a history teacher, by the way. And we didn't have any money. So I remember thinking, my mom worked so hard, but here we are cutting coupons and, and whatnot because she was a teacher in Louisiana in the 90s. So I remember thinking, that's not what I want to do. I want to do something else. So I went to college and I wanted to study constitutional law. I was taking all of these constitutional law classes. But I was incredibly disillusioned by my senior year. So I would call my mom and complain. She would listen patiently, and then one time she said, why don't you come watch me teach and maybe see it from a different perspective and see what you think. And my mom, she's not a lady you can really say no to, so I thought, you know, I'll just go and, and watch her teach and this can be the, the end of it. And then when I sat in her classroom, I watched her teach high school seniors, and she was teaching civics, and they were engaged, and they were debating, and they were making all of these connections, and it was super relevant to their lives. And, they just really enjoyed the class. I remember thinking, okay, I want to give this a go. I want to give it a shot. And right when I graduated um, college, I went and started working at a summer camp and then started teaching right away at age 21. Uh, and I, I never looked back. So my trajectory is a little different. I, it was the last thing I wanted to do, and now I can't imagine doing anything else. Hi. Um, so I think I have a little bit more of a, I have a stereotypical, somewhat, um, story. So I knew I kind of wanted to be a teacher since second grade, teaching my, my teacher. I used to put um, paper on the TV to like let it stick and then teach my sister, trying to like show her like, A, B, C. Um, so, but I also just really loved history. And by the time I was in eighth grade, I was really inspired by my eighth grade teacher. His name was Mr. T. Um, who, <laughs> still remember him very vividly in his class. Um, but he inspired me to be a history teacher just because he kind of helped get me a lot more passionate. I was that student who was very obsessed. Um, I knew the Gettysburg Address by heart. I watched 24 hour documentaries on the Civil War. Um, and so his class was a really great time for me. He taught, he used to do military reenactments outside of school. Um, so he came in with the uniforms and we looked at the battles and things like that. Um, and it wasn't until I was 20 years old and kind of, you know, getting into the historian field that I kind of reflected back on my time in his class and realized that we talked all about the Civil War and we never had one lesson on slavery. And I still can't imagine or conceptualize how you could teach an entire class on that. Um, and I also started to realize, because at that time I was an early modern you're an early modern historian focusing on women at the court of Elizabeth the first, and I started to realize I know nothing about my own history. <laughs> this is kind of crazy. And so I kind of took up this journey of really enriching myself with my own history and the history of others, and then thinking about how could I merge the historiographies that I'm reading and I'm researching? Why is that not happening in the classroom? And so for me, I think I wanted to take up what I see is kind of a black tradition of education and trying to merge these two stories together. And so that's what kind of brought me into the classroom. Thank you all so much. Um, that's amazing. And so we, in the last panel, there was this conversation about um, like dark history of you know, teaching dark histories and what that could look like and maybe how we can integrate that with, you know, American history, straight narratives. And so I'm curious if you, from your experience in the classroom, just want to share a specific example of a time that you taught Sort of a lesson or a unit addressing the dark history and just like what your approaches are to teaching that kind of content. Maybe you can start with speaking. Yeah, 
luckily right now I teach on so I teach at Windsor Public Schools, I teach in Connecticut, and so I'm also teaching the Black and Latinx course currently. And right now we're teaching resistance and enslavement, so I have a lot to say. Um, and so this past week we've been talking a lot about resistance. And so for me, when I think about dark histories or dark or controversial histories, I always kind of frame myself with thinking about, yes, things were bad, um, but there was also a lot of resistance that was there. Um, and so what I kind of started my unit of is getting my students to think about what are the different ways that we resist, right? Um, what does that look like? And a lot of them had a frame of reference. They talked about going to Black Lives Matter protests. They talked about writing letters and you know what they do in their own communities and then being able to apply that back. And so we looked at the WPA narratives, we talked about, um, you know, slave rebellions and kind of talked about what are the ways that people were able to utilize the resources around them. Um, one thing that we did last Wednesday, which was probably my best lesson, so my best kind of experience um, this year so far, is we did a chalk talk kind of going around the classroom where we talked about enslaved medicine. Um, we talked about how black women were able to utilize head wraps as a way to assert their agency. We talked about black spirituals. Um, and they were able to make and make really relevant connections about the ways that they do that today, right? Like what are the outfits that you wear that you're trying to make a stand? Um, how can healing be a form of resistance? Um, and so when I think of how to approach dark history, it's all about trying to think about how people have challenged that as opposed to it just being a rendition of trauma. So I, I teach U.S. history in Louisiana, and as many people know, Louisiana's history is dark in, in incredible, um, you know, in, in vast ways. So one of the ways that I try to capture or, or teach this you know, dark history is by being as upfront about it as possible, and not just teaching it in certain themes of whether it's just oppression or not, but also highlighting, again, how people fought back. And one of the uh, aspects, when I can think of particular lessons, so I taught in 10 years in St. Martin Parish, which was a working class, is a working class suburb of New Orleans. And I was continually looking at local history to try to bring to life for my students. The more we can you know, make it relevant to them, the more they can uh, grasp and, and, and gain as much from it as possible. So as I was researching a lot of this local history, I came across uh, some congressional documents that highlighted a massacre that happened in the exact parish that I teach and in the, on the exact grounds where, where I teach. So I started really digging into this history and trying to figure out, wow, like this not only needs to you know, get out there, but it needs to you know, get to my students. They have to learn this history that has so often been buried. And when I was looking through the records, a lot of the records would call it a riot. And I believe, um, I think Dr. Jeffries referenced earlier that these events were not riots. Riots, you know, they insinuate that there was two sides, chaotically exchanging blows, but that was definitely not the case. However, uh, black newspapers at the time would call it a massacre, albeit they would speak about it in French as massacre. So I uh, would call it the 1868 St. Bernard Parish Massacre, and I would bring these documents to my students, and they could see their last names in a lot of these documents. Uh, I was teaching the the descendants of the victims and the perpetrators, and sometimes in the very same classrooms, and a lot of them were friends with one another. They would uh, eat lunch and play sports together. And I think in some ways bringing it home was a way that we can uh, get students invested and to learn their own history and have these really tough, complex conversations. And that's where the, the pedagogy comes in, right? Like we have to learn how we can have these tough, tough conversations to embrace discomfort to, you know, seek to understand before being understood or, you know, assume positive intent. Also, when you teach a lot of these issues in this art history as well, again, to reiterate your point, I mean, it is vital to highlight stories of resistance. I not only teach things that are traumatic, but we learn about the 1811 German Coast Uprising, one of the largest slave insurrections in U.S. history, and we visit the sites where people fought back. So, so to make it local and also to make it as um, relevant to their lives as possible, I think in a way it lends itself to the student engagement that we so often try to find as teachers. Um, so first of all, I just want to say um, earlier there was a conversation about content versus pedagogy, and we, we were chatting before, uh, we were like, well, really, if you want to be good, 
They're the same thing. Or, or not the, exactly the same thing. Um, but you really need both and you can't choose. Um, but I wanted to talk about, um, so I teach, um, and this also goes to the CDP framework that was mentioned earlier. I teach a unit um, organized around the essential question, should we cancel Columbus Day? Um, the way I do this um, is I start um, by showing images of the 2020 uh, Black Lives Matter protests at the uh, Christopher Columbus statue in Chicago that has since been taken down. Um, and I just have the students generate as many questions as they can, and we go through a process of um, ranking, modifying um, the questions. Um, and then, but I don't answer them. And that's one of the things I think is really important is that when I teach dark history, I'm there are a lot more questions than there are answers because I can't give like simplistic answers to this. I can have my answer, but I can't give you the answer. If I'm asking a question that I know the answer to, that, I mean, sometimes it's necessary, but it shouldn't be the whole business of my teaching. So then um, I'll read the kids a book called Encounter by Jane Newlin, um, which is a historically accurate fiction account of um, Columbus's arrival, um, told with the perspective of a tiny little boy. And when I was studying history in college here, um, we talked about uh, this is something my thesis advisor, my social research, taught me um, reading against the archive. Right, that when we don't have a written record of oppressed people, we use the archive that was written by oppressors, but we also need to use some imaginative techniques. Um, so I discuss with my students, is this a valid historical source and why? Um, and then we'll read Columbus's journal. I don't have them, I, purpose, I purposely choose a selection that could seem ambiguous, um, that it's not it is definitely racist, but it's not like super, super obvious. And I have the kids to be like, okay, what was Columbus's attitude towards the <coughs> no people? And then finally, I'll give the kids, <coughs> I'll give the kids um, four different secondary sources, historians narratives about Columbus, with a little bit of biographical info about each historian and how I'll have them evaluate the historian's perspective and bias. And the point is, I, I have an opinion about that, a question, should we cancel Columbus Day? Like, of course I do, but they arrive at that answer. And here's the secret, is that I am providing sources in such a way that they are going to come to the conclusion that we should cancel Columbus Day. I've never had a kid be like, no, Columbus Day is pretty cool. <laughs> but I actually am providing um, both positive and negative sources, and so that's a little bit of um, shielding myself, but it's also because I want, I don't want them to think it because I said it, I want them to think it because they came to those conclusions through rigorous historical inquiry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just wanted to follow up just because it sparked a thought for me, um, and just because um, she's here. But another thing you think of when dark, when you think about dark histories is that um, a lot of times people will say, oh, okay, well, it might not be in the archival research. Um, but I do think, and I've always said this to students, I think, I'm speaking about this from a black history perspective, but I think it can be applied to so many histories. Black history is also something that should be experienced and looking outside of kind of like the traditional documents that you see. And so that's something else of a really good way of being able to, you know, for example, communicate the murder of Emmett Till by looking at songs, right? Um, I was thinking about, you know, Asian history, you know, you might not be, like, you know, you might not be able to always see the documents when you can in that um, instance, but looking at the poems that were written on the walls of Angel Island, like, the, those, they, we've left, they, the people have left their kind of, like, interpretation, they've left their stories, it's just trying to figure out a way to find them, and I just wanted to also shout out Professor Fay, um, just because one of um, her book, The White Image and the Black Mind, my, my students have read excerpts from, of how you go when, you know, there's not many sources that say how black people feel about white people, maybe in honest circumstances, but how do you go out and find that? And so you have to be really creative with that as well. Yeah. No, I was just uh, referencing, I was thinking about the, the textbook conversation, uh, 
we just kind of was having and I was almost thinking in my head like it's so beyond just words for students it is song it's poems it's experiences it's bringing so it's just this vast amount of information multiple perspectives that will never be able to you know find its way in the Louisiana history textbook uh, and and capture into the essence as much as as humanly possible it, it goes beyond so much of, of what uh, people can give us to do that we have to go out and, and do ourselves as history teachers. Um, oh, go. I was just going to say um, two things about his uh, textbooks. One is somebody said kids don't read, and they do if you pick the right thing for them to read. Um, and um, the second thing I was going to say was related to what Professor Blackhawk said. I don't know if he's still here. But um, about um, sovereignty and understanding American history from the outside. I find in Chicago, it's not that they haven't been taught about slavery or the civil rights movement, it's that they've been taught the same tired, victimizing narrative over and over and over again, and they don't know, like, the continents. Like, they have, they, there's this perception that Black kids on the south side of Chicago don't need to know about the world. They need to know about the American Revolution, uh, slavery and Martin Luther King. Um, and so one of the things that I'm really trying to do is um, take the focus of focus outside of the U.S. to reflect back on U.S. history, right? So like with Columbus, right, we started in Chicago, but we're looking at indigeneity, we're looking at Spanish Empire, right? Or like, let's go to South Africa and look at nonviolence there, and then we can reflect back about what we know about them, right? Let's go to Nicaragua and talk about an American Empire there, then we can think about what was happening at the same time here. Uh, and I, I want to jump in with a quick question because you're talking about diversity of sources and vision of ancient right? So, um, how are you thinking specifically about photographs that show traumatic things? I, I think about this from when I was teaching history that um, I put up the photograph of Emmett Till um, in the casket showing lynching images, and I have a lot, I think our, our thoughts about how we're using those with students has really um, changed a lot in the last 20 years. So, I'm, I'm curious how you're thinking about that now in your teaching. I'm going to be honest. I decided in 2020, after seeing the George Floyd video, I don't need to see no more. You don't need to see no more of any, like, especially when it comes down to lynching photos, we don't need to see any more to be able to empathize with the fact that we are human beings. So I personally don't show those images in my classroom. Um, so for me, what I've substituted that with is, again, music, it's song. Um, I don't have to show whipping photos for my students to understand that people were with. Um, what I can show um, or what I can have my students experience are black spirituals. I can have them listen and watch videos of the Macintosh singers. I can have my students um, look at modern day images of how black, indigenous, Asian people are utilizing and kind of like trying to utilize images of empowerment, I don't need to show any more trauma, but that's just my kind of view, and I just don't think the students want to see it anymore. Um, one thing I had, this was in, um, this was in my civics class, and um, it was kind of a hard conversation because I was trying to explain to my students, they're looking at um, Barack Obama's reaction to the Trayvon Martin's shooting, and we're at that point where students don't know where who Trayvon Martin is. It was really sad because I had to, I had to make the realization, and I had to almost say, you know, Trayvon Martin was your George Floyd, and my Trayvon Martin was my mother's Rodney King, and my great grandmother's Eugene Williams. You know, so I just think that we don't need to kind of show that for students to be able to understand because they're living it. You know, um, all students are living that. So that's kind of like my viewpoint on it. I, um, you mentioned, I have a giant classroom library and I work really hard to make sure it is super um, culturally relevant and not just like, I think about mirrors and windows, so students need to both see themselves reflected in text and they also need to learn about other experiences. Um, and I think one of the things that allows me to do, I have, 
I have books in that library that do have, um, like I have a booklet set of books that has those photos of uh, Emmett Till, right? And I think I have to have a conversation with the kids about, you know, because it's fifth and sixth graders. Some of these books are going to have curse words. Some of these books are going to have sexuality. Some of these books are going to have really troublesome history. And like, Let's talk about how you navigate that and how you make that choice for yourself. <laughs> I mean, it's really important as history teachers to not continually traumatize our students every time they come into the classroom because the trauma didn't stop, it's still ongoing. And I think sometimes people fail uh, to realize that because it, it's not something that ended with the Civil Rights Movement or with, with any, any type of movement, it still continues and, and still happens. So I teach juniors and seniors, and we are fortunate now post pandemic for every student to have a little Chromebook and they can actually type their notes while I'm talking now. And so I will 100% mention things like the photo of Emmett Till has changed this, uh, you know, the, the movement has led to spark so many movements in, in the back. And I give as many fair warnings as possible. And I tell them, like, if you want to Google this and research this, I will never stop any student from, you know, engaging in that inquiry. However, and then I let them know, of course, the, the, what the photo uh, looks like. Now, from day one, I let my students know, you know, there are going to be times where we're going to talk about certain instances. And they fill out a Google form every day, it's kind of like an entrance ticket. And on there, they, they know the lesson of what it's going to be about, and they can opt out in certain ways to not be present for certain days, but get the lessons in a much different type of way. And I work with a, a couple of other history teachers in this regard as well, because some students have been through incredibly traumatic experiences and might not want to sit through you know, something that I'm talking about history that they have actually lived through. And of course, I, I've never had a student you know, abuse this room. It's very rare that a student decides to opt out. But I think it's very important to give students that option so we're not continually re traumatizing uh, kids. I mean, we all study history here, so we know the, the horrors and of what happened in US history. So it's important to, one, not shy away from them. But also balance that with, our, you know, with not trying to re-traumatize it. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, they, just building on that a little bit, I think you all at least touched on like sort of student reactions to this material and like just the connections to student lives that are always there. Um, but I was just wondering if any of you wanted to expand on like how your students react, respond to the content, but also like the pedagogical methods that you use in teaching these things. So my students are hungry for this information, for hidden history or dark history, whatever we call it. They want to know what transpired throughout history because they know and they're very aware that they have been lied to throughout their short lives because they had access, many of them had access to the internet, and many of them talk to their parents who give them a much different version of the war game version that they have, that they might have experienced throughout middle school. So uh, students, in many ways, they want this history. They're very, they're more perceptive. Receptive, and, and I think we give them credit for because they know when you are shy away from history or, or not, you know, being as accurate or if there's, there's more to the story. So, uh, in my experience, students seem hungry for this history and they go off and they do their own research. Just Wednesday, I had a student walk in and she asked me, Mrs. Deere, have you heard of the School of the Americas and the CIA overthrows after World War II? <laughs> it was like a 16 year old girl, and I was like, you can't even the Civil War yet. And I was like, where did you get this? And she showed me the website, she found the books, and this was all in one night. Like, we're not, we're not, no one's gonna be able to, the conversations about curriculum are fascinating because students are gonna find it, no doubt about it. They are hungry for it, they want it, and they know when they're being uh, misled or if things are being hit. That's, that's my experience. I've, I've been fortunate to have students that, that want to learn about what happened in the past. Um. My students really wanted to come with me here when I told them. <laughs> they were like, so if we were, if we like were really rich, couldn't we all come? I was like, I mean, just, no. <laughs> um, but I did promise to convey some of their messages. And I think one of the central things is, you know, we're lucky in Illinois, we don't have these kinds of limitations. Um, I like to say I have 99 problems in Chicago public schools, but book bans are not one. Um, 
and um, I yeah I, mm -hmm. yes. yeah right. But I do think that there is an effort to, especially my experience, just the more impoverished the school and the school community, the more teachers are worried about shielding kids um, from content deemed inappropriate. Um, and it's odd because these are the communities where we know some of our students are living in the homeless shelters, some of our students are witnessing that violence, right? So it's like the more they're experiencing outside of the school, teachers feel this real need to put a tight line uh, or a tight line on what can what can be discussed in school. Um, and it's because we all have to um, handle the trauma of knowing that children deal with that trauma that they shouldn't have to be exposed to, right? But what's not the right approach is to say, well, there can't be any books with curse words, or there can't be any books that talk about teenage pregnancy, or um, you can't um, teach kids that, you know, violent protest is sometimes justified, right? Which are all things that I heard, not from students or from parents, but from other teachers. Um, and so, I think it's important to be like, they see it, and not just because of the internet, because these children are experiencing the brunt of really bad policy decisions, and if we don't create a safe space for them to talk about it, for them to talk about sexuality and substance abuse and all of these things, where are they going to talk about it? They're going to imbibe these messages, right? So. Let's give them books. There's nothing safer than experiencing these things through books, right? <laughs> um, let's, you know, let's have those courageous conversations with kids because that they want it. I agree, they're hungry for it, and they're they're gonna know anyway. They're just gonna get status quo dominant messaging otherwise. Um, similarly, my students are like 40 minutes away from here. So when I told them I was coming, they said, one, you're missing the pet rally. And then she was like, you're going to really miss that? I was like, I think it's important. Um, but they also had some messages and words. And I, you know, I've been asking my students, and I think, you know, I love this sign of trust the teachers, but trust our kids. Trust our kids. Uh, they can do stuff with, if you just arm them with the tools, the same thing that we're asking educators to do. Um, and so when I think about their reaction, kind of aligned with their feedback, is they said, one, making it as real as possible, but making it as powerful as possible. Um, our first unit, I was able, and like, I'm sure we're going to talk about this later, but I'm lucky enough to be crafting and writing my own curriculum as I teach it, but along with my students. Um, and so, our first unit focused on language and what is the power of language, that kind of central theme. And it was interesting because we took so many case studies. We looked at the census classifications. We looked at how whiteness was in itself even defined. So we looked at the Thind and Oswe cases and how that impacted Asian American access to citizenship. So we talked about all the different ways in which language has been used to oppress and marginalize. But then we switched and we focused on how have Black and Indigenous people of color been able to utilize language to organize, to, co to build coalitions together. So they, again, 9 through 12 students, including my baby freshman, were in there discussing, okay, well, what are the strengths and limitations to political Blackness? Um, what is the, the kind of like, what can we do with this term Latinx? You know? And by the end, having a conversation on what am I going to do how is this going to influence me? And it was great. My students led most of it. You know, they sat, they discussed, they brought in their own articles. Um, you know, one student said, you know, I come, my family's never heard of this term Latinx, so I don't identify with that. Um, another student, okay, well, I kind of think it's a, a helpful term. But watching them debate this out, I wasn't involved, I was just listening having my own thought questions. And so that's kind of, I think, the end part of all of this is how do we get our students excited? I, you know, I'm, there's a lot of stuff going on with education that is not going on with history, and we all know that. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to be sad, but there's also a lot of reasons to be excited. Like, there's a lot of reasons to be excited, so give that to your kids too. Get them out, get them going. So I think the question isn't even, isn't even what's race got to do with it, is what the hell are we going to do about it? 
Like, what are we gonna do about it? How are you gonna arm your students to get involved in that conversation? It goes far beyond just kind of giving them cool facts that they can bring up at a bar when they're 27. You know, like, like I've been thinking, we're talking about uh, student engagement. So often throughout these debates and the hyper-politicized nature of education today, students are never, never seem to be the problem. They seem to be the solution because yeah, they, they are, again, hungry for this knowledge, and the things that politicians label as divisive or, you know, controversial, a lot of those topics, issues of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, are the topics that students want to talk about the most because it has to do with their identity and lived experiences. So we talk about windows, you know, they can, mirrors and windows, they see themselves, and they can look out into the world and see how, uh, what brings people together, what makes people different, and, and go from there. So a lot of times I just feel like the conversations, these divisive topics, again, are the ones that get the most engagement and are the most fulfilling in the classroom. Um, Dr. Ladson Billings mentioned, um, which by the way, Dr. Ladson Billings is my hero. <laughs> I feel really cool to have been on the Zoom with her. Um, but um, she mentioned the concept of a child, and that those are such powerful words because I think um, the concept of a child is something we don't discuss a lot, but it's so important, especially as a fifth and sixth grade teacher. And it's for any white children have been infantilized. Which is not necessarily um, good in some ways because I think there's this feeling that they can't handle it, but also there's um, in majority, what, in, in traditional white schools, this um, baking method of teaching where the teacher lectures and everyone else takes notes uh, has been dominant for a century, right? And um, in segregated black schools, um, uh, this was my this was my senior saying, you know, um, I wrote about um, the pedagogy of uh, segregated uh, rural schools in the Jim Crow South, and a lot of those progressive practices that I think we're all trying to emulate, to emulate today, they were happening in those schools a hundred years ago, right? And so, I mean, and that pedagogical tradition is one of the things we lost, right? But I think the conception of a child, right? Um, if black kids get to be, or kids of color get to be treated as children, it's in a way that's infantilizing and doesn't take them seriously as members of our society. Um, but often they don't get to be children. They don't get to be children, right? Um, and then it's like, oh, well, you know, we're just trying to keep them from talking about the dangerous stuff because if we talk about anything serious, they'll go, they'll lose control, right? Um, which is also an area of effort for keeping it appropriate. So, I mean, I think a lot of people are talking about children without really thinking about that, like, with a real disrespectful language about children and what they're capable of and what they need. And that's not important. And sorry, just one thing, I just want to emphasize, this is also for white kids too. Yes. Like, white kids want to know about what yeah. whiteness is. Yeah. I want to know about what whiteness is because whiteness also is constructed and so it's empowering for white students to be able to think about like how wow this system was constructed it was a currency there was an investment in it i can buy this from now and this is how i can organize white students want to feel that too and so it's almost a similar kind of like notion of like the same thing that happened in reconstruction we have to protect white women that's what that is it's the same kind of false argument of we have to protect these children they don't need to be protected they want to be seen and taken seriously and last i just wanted to say a lot of times our students are saying we want to learn about us it's not a superficial understanding of representation they want to learn about them, their time, their the, what they're experiencing, what they're seeing. And in the same way that there's a lot of sad stuff happening, there's a lot of empowering stuff that's happening as well. And we have to kind of take note of that in the classroom. I agree 100%. A lot of these anti-CRT bills are really anti-honest education bills. What they try to do is, or what they say is that, you know, you, they don't want people to teach about anything that might um, cause discomfort. And what they really mean is white discomfort. They were trying to, they're saying they're trying to protect white students, but in a sense, what they do is create a wall for white students and harm them because they don't give them the tools to understand the complex world in which 
they live in and benefit from. And learning happens in this topic. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, right, where if you go to education grad school, that's like one of the first things you learn. But none of these people read these laws know anything about pedagogy, right? And that's where, you know, like, content is necessary but not sufficient because pedagogy is an art and science, and a lot of people are neglecting it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, we we want to leave time for students. So I'm going to ask like one more maybe large question, but given that we, we've established the idea that you know students are ready to be necessary for students to learn this kind of thing, and yet there's still all this pushback, either direct or just like in the larger climate, how are you all navigating that and sort of what kind of support might you need or how do you think we can best move forward from this? Because I mean I know that there's a combination of despair, but what are your thoughts on that? I would say I'm going to actually kind of take this a little bit to the side because I feel like especially being in Connecticut there's a sense that like this isn't affecting us um you know like I said I'm teaching this African-American and Latino course um but like even in what are considered to be safe spaces for educators you still see kind of like you know a lot of contesting like there's a lot of people arguing right um you know I face a lot of pushback because I'm a more project-based centered teacher. Um, and so much of, I know that you mentioned the banking method, you know, the idea that the final product of almost every history lesson is supposed to be a test. Um, and so what I think, what I need, or what I wanna see is just for more people to see all this work happening in, in kind of like a circular motion as opposed to kind of being in separate silos. You know, a lot of people think, oh, anti-racist teaching is kind of its own thing. No, anti-racist teaching is SEL. Anti-racist teaching is access to literacy. Anti-racist teaching is also um, culturally relevant um, pedagogy. It's community-based teaching. It's reaching out to your students and their parents and their community and helping them to see that. And so I think that even in the safest districts, we still don't see that happening. There's internal fights within departments about, you know, whether or not you know, again, whether or not we should get a test or not. Um, and so I think that that's more what I would like to see or more what I want to see reflected is, again, more hope and um, new ideas, new visions of education is what I think we're searching for. I want to piggyback off that. One of my big concerns that I'm seeing um, that's happening both um, in these states uh, with, with these anti-CRT bills, but also not, it's the deprofessionalization of teaching. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that as we have a teacher shortage, and we know, right, that some of these states are pushing teachers out, right, um, those positions are being filled by people who do not know how to teach. They may have expertise in their content, they may not, right? And I think it's like, Plenty of people I know, or like people in blue states who consider themselves good liberals, will say, I'm gonna go teach. I love kids, I know a lot about my content. And here's the thing is that teaching is you need to be an expert in content, you need to be an expert in pedagogy, you need to be an expert in classroom management, you need to have a historical and sociological lens. I mean, I can't imagine walking into my classroom not having read everything I did in my history major about the history of education because I use that every single day. Um, you need to be a social worker at times, right? So like, the, it's an incredibly complex art and I think a lot of people, um, including, you know, liberal people just boil that down and they don't, uh, they don't treat that that professional respect, and that's why I'm so grateful to be here because I think I look at this banner, right? I think um, this whole event is about respect for teaching as the intellectual um, life or death career that it is, right? I mean, I, I think it's the most comparable profession as being a doctor, right? We have lives on our hands, and if you don't um, take the time to learn how to do this, you have blood on your hands, right? And if you and if you go into it with hostile intentions, you definitely have blood on your hands. So um, taking the time for, you know, for what support do we need? I think um, connections between the academy and teaching both destigmatizes the career of teaching, legitimizes the intellectual aspect of teaching that is very often neglected, um, and um, 
calls attention to the fact that I'm just to have us here, right? And to say that we actually, it's not just researchers presenting to us, but we have expertise too, is such a beautiful acknowledgement of who we are as professionals and so I'm really grateful to you. Likewise, I'm, I'm super grateful. I've been at you know, education conferences, but to be here with academics and historians and you know, some of my favorite historians that my students read. Uh, yeah, like you know, your students said a lot of amazing things. Mine did as well, but one of them was like, well, you need to get you know a selfie with David Blight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> but in terms of pushback, it's very interesting because there are different groups that do push back against teachers that that is leading to this retention crisis. I mean, we have over 300,000 teachers, less teachers now than we did before the pandemic. That's, that's, a, that's a wild number. And a lot of that pushback is coming from the systemic level. I feel like it's framed in a way that it's parents who are pushing back, but that's a false psychology because millions of teachers are also parents. And <laughs> they also have kids and they also have you know, shared values with, <laughs> right, with, with, uh, with parents. So um, I thought in two separate districts, one was in Trump country and the other was, is in New Orleans. And the parents of both of these districts want their kids to do really well. And they have shared values in that regard. And I think there's something that, that can lend itself there because once parents get to know you, then you build relationships with them and you call them of positive aspects of their students, which is something I gained from a uh, young professor here to call parents ASAP, day one, week one, establish these positive relationships. So when they do, you know, maybe see something that might cause discomfort, they already have your contact, they can already talk with you, they can already engage. But in terms of pushback, a lot of it is coming from that systemic level of state legislators and politicians who have one thing in mind, and that is to delegitimize the profession in order to uh, ensure that we divest in public education. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I love that point. I know we talked about earlier too, of like trying to not have all just be negative reactions again. So that we would establish the positive relationships and like have actual human connections. I think that's so important. Um, I know we want to do audience Q and A now. So can I? Yeah. I think it was. Are you just raising my hand? Oh, you're raising your hand. Okay. Well, I, I, um, Go ahead, Mary. I so appreciate all of you, and and um, we have we have been listening a lot today. And before we go into Q and A, I want to do two things. First, um, I want to give you about three minutes to have reactions and talk with the people around you about some of the things that you heard. Um, we do, I do this in class um, to give students an opportunity to first digest some of the things that they're thinking about and allow some questions to bubble up. Um, and I also really want to center the teachers who are in the audience to um, be asking the first question and be in dialogue with the teachers here. So, um, David, I want you to hold that question. Um, and we'll give, give voice to the teachers, and I also want to particularly give voice to um, any students who are here. I don't know that we have high school students, but we have a number of young students who are in the audience. Um, so we're going to put the priority on uh, teachers and students um, asking the questions when, when we come back. So take about three minutes to talk and react with the people around you, um, and then let's hear your questions. Oh, that's great idea. There's like such gravity fire questions. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Um, talked about it in advance, um, and then we'll open things up to the broader questions. Um, most definitely. Uh, thank, well, first and foremost, thank y'all so much for having me. Uh, I'm just a kid from Nickerson and Gardens Projects who happened to go get a degree and make some out of himself. So thank y'all for giving me this opportunity to stand in front of y'all and talk to y'all about some important issues. Um, I would like to start whenever they pass that critical race theory law. I was scared out of my on my mind. I'm like, wait, this is all I teach. What I'm gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, you know, I, a lot of things uh, transpired between them passing that law and, and during my teaching. One of those things was uh, the superintendent at my school put me on TV. Um, I was on CBS. Uh, I feel like it's like Sky Fox or something like that. And, uh, it went. It went global. And when it went global, I was getting threatening calls, threatening emails, threatening text messages. Now, how could I even get my number? Um, and that kind of scared me because I didn't think that people were really outraged about a little bit of black history being taught in schools, you know? So um, that, that kind of scared me a little bit. But then the real scare came whenever um, the law firm reached out to me, asked me if I'd like to be a plaintiff on the case. I said, man, you, you think Governor State going to take my uh, teacher certificate and they're going to let me go if I, if I choose to be a part of this case? And it was just like, yeah, I mean, it, it is a big risk. But I took it, though, uh, because, you know, there, there are millions of kids who need these lessons in their, in their, um, in their life. Uh, they need to hear about what's going on in our society, they need to know what happened in the past. They need to know these things in order for us to have a brighter, better future. And that goes for any race, color, creed, whatever it is that you identify with. We all need to know what happened to our uh, to our people, what happened to the society. Um, right now, I'm just you know I'm walking on eggshells. They took they took down like three of my books that I was going to have my seniors read this year. Uh, one of those books was Powernomics by Dr. Carl Anderson, um, The 50 of Law and Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by uh, Dr. Joy DeGrod. All three of those books have been taken down on my bookshelf, and now we're reading Shakespeare. And, you know, but, you know, I, I'm teaching Othello. I don't know if that's... <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if that, you know, if I'm crossing boundaries, but... Yeah, we, we're, at, we're at a point in history, in our, in our time, in our society, that anything that we do as educators is people who just trying to make a better living for our, for, for our future generations, where, you know, you, you're bound to get counseled, you're bound to get uh, scrutinized, you're bound to get crucified at this point. So uh, I'm just happy that we have a voice in this matter. Thank you. Okay, questions from teachers, questions from students. Um, hi, I'm a teacher. I asked a question in the last panel. Um, I have two questions. They're kind of complicated and I'm still trying to process them, so my apologies if they don't make sense at first. Um, the first question is related to student engagement. Um, I teach at a Title I school, and I think one of the most overwhelming things that I learned my first year is that my students have been so underserved by public education that they don't believe in their own abilities to um, tackle complicated historical sources or to think critically about history. They've been told for so long that, oh, you're a low level student. You don't have those, you're not at the Lexile level that you need to be, you need to be in this, um, read 180 class where you're you know learning on a fifth grade reading level instead of being taught um, how to attack these like rigorous sources in a history class so 
when I have attempted to do those really cool lessons where I bring in the primary sources, they just, some of my students just give up because they don't have the skills and they don't have um, the belief in themselves. It's almost like a learned helplessness, I suppose. So I guess um, my question there is, do you encounter that same thing? And if so, how do you address it? Um, and then my second question is about, I think it comes down to passion, maybe. Um, I think that in Florida, especially in the district where I'm at, there's so much top down pressure placed on teachers that um, I was telling the person next to me, I feel as though I've been like bound and gagged. Like I can't do anything that I think is good for my students. Um, and I'm tired and I feel like I'm doing everything wrong every day at work. So my second question is, do you feel that same pressure in the states where you're working? And if so, how do you work within that? Thank you. I can maybe help the first one. Um, I mean, the second one, yes, I'm tired. <laughs> um, the first one, because um, I can tell my resource and at my previous school, um, about when at the beginning of the year, about 10% of students were on grade level for reading. By the end, I would usually get it up to 50%, um, but that's still, um, and this is part of why I don't use textbooks, right? It's because like, they're just not accessible to students. Um, images really help. Um, I take very short excerpts from, like, I'll use the history books that, like, I just read and enjoyed, but I, I will take very short excerpts, and I will modify them. Um, I have been told that best practice is to give a modified version and a real version. I don't, for the same reason that I don't want students to feel um, discouraged or stigmatized, so I will um, judiciously modify um, and then using a ton of visual support, right? Like often I'll get a picture and a graph and a graph and a video, and then by the time we get to the primary source, um, and here's the thing: like you have to be a historian, right? Because you have to find all that stuff. Nobody has made like the perfect, beautiful curriculum that you can just go through every day, and it's going to have all those things that are available to struggling readers, right? So. It's a lot of work. And like to your second question, yeah, it's really tiring, right? It's really tiring when my district spends millions of dollars on a curriculum. And I'm like, I can't use this because my kids can't read it, you know? Um, but I do think that um oh, the other thing I want to say, I'm a fourth year teacher, so um, you know, I can't be like, you know, if my mom gives me experience, but <laughs> stick with it because I do a lot of this expertise is not something that was, it's not like on day one, I was like, here's this beautiful inquiry unit, right? And so I think um, simply by um, learning and growing and keeping, as long as we know our values, we can continue to grow in our practice. Um, my, my sister often tells me, don't just think about the kids you're teaching now, also to think about the kids you're teaching 20 years. Um, and so I'm thinking, you know, I want to be the best I can for my kids today. And I also know that I'm in this for the long run and that uh, my goal is to be the best teacher I can, not just for these kids, but for the next few years. Uh, in terms of your second question, I teach in Louisiana, and there are a lot of similarities politically with Louisiana and, and Florida. And state legislators trying to pass this quote anti CRT bill, which again is really anti honest education because they're not trying to get the actual CRT out of the classroom. They're trying to get history from marginalized groups out of the classroom, like the actual stuff that really happened to uh, to people in, in U.S. history. So uh, we had legislators try to pass it, and what we did was, and it's exhausting, but we fought like hell against it. I wrote op eds, we organized. We had unions, we called legislators, we showed up to the state capitol, and we continually fought to the point where the person who proposed it was getting tripped up when he was in the House Education Committee proposing it because we sent questions to other politicians to ask him. And they were literally reading our questions verbatim. And he said something really awful. We made it all the way around 
the country. He said you need to teach the good in slavery and the bad in slavery. The good man said, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but you know, Washington Post took it, the New York Times, everywhere. We said that we took that clip, we sent it out. We're like, this is what this these people believe when they're trying to, you know, push that legislation in education. And so I will say in terms of being tired, it's an exhausting fight, but in many ways it's inspiring because we are engaged in a sort of struggle. And we need to realize that we cannot do it alone. I think Dr. Ortiz alluded to, you know, unionizing and organizing. So if you are tired, you know, reach out to as many people as possible and engage in this work with like-minded people because the solidarity is out there. We just need to build it. I just wanted to mention, because I haven't talked about it um, since we've done it, but I also teach the, um, a, the US survey, I teach a U.S. history survey at Southern. And you'd be surprised, because it's the same reading skills that we feel like people struggle with in high school, or the same ones that college students do, it's the same ones that graduate students do. And so what, for me, in terms of helping students to kind of like get at those sources is helping and reflecting on how I'm taking them. You know, I had to teach the Federalist 10 papers, and I'm like, Madison, what are you saying? <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. And I had to read it over and over and over again. So I thought about how am I processing this, and then give it to the students. And I also think that this is just kind of a note to, um, you know, the like historians and curriculum writers of so often we provide these really, really awesome thoughts and awesome primary sources, but no real practice. And that's why historians and educators need really need to work together um, as opposed to a kind of thing where, you know, and again, historians are awesome. But it's just about how um, a lot of times I think teachers go to historians or go to conferences like this and they just try and take in all the information as opposed to thinking about how can we work in tandem together to really make this change. Um, and again, it's the same thing. I you know, is reading and, and modifying. And so the second point, um, I just want to talk a little bit less about the organizing part, but just in general as history teachers, and I, I think I was kind of feeling this a little bit today, it's not our job to teach students thousands of years of history. It is not my job. I cannot do that. I am still learning. Every time I read a book, something changes in my mind. So what I'm trying to do is equip my students to have those tools. And I see so many teachers um, through the collective and the work of working with educators that there's this feeling of like, oh, I got to get all of it. I got to get it all. And it's kind of like, no, if you can teach your students about racial formations and how slavery was able to form, then they might be able to understand systems like the criminal justice system in the, in the present day. They can use those tools on their own to keep kind of like going. So I think don't get inundated with feeling like you have to go in like the savior. I want to address your first question because we have to understand that like as teachers, we're more than just teachers. We gotta be counselors, we gotta be therapists, we gotta be everything that our students need. And if we don't continue to do those things for our students, we're gonna see suicide rates continue to plummet. Um, we see that social media is taking over our kids' lives. So if we don't take a stand and do the things that we need to do as educators, um, then we're looking at a whole different society coming up. So uh, and I don't know, y'all. I know y'all are most likely able to predict the future because if you see what's happening now, then you see what that leads to. So we have a generation for the students who don't know their history, a generation of students who don't even have, you know, just proper manners then we're looking at a whole different um, society in the future. Uh, and that just goes back to, you know, the things that we're doing as educators to ensure that our kids got the love that they need, because most of them are not getting it at home. Some of them go to school for breakfast and lunch because they're not eating at home. So knowing these things, knowing what we're up against, you know, some of us had to step in and be parents too. Uh, you know, because, you know, we're, we're in it for the students, am I right? We're in it for them, right? And if we're in it for the students and we're in it for the kids, then we got to do all we can to make sure the kids is good. Um, because before I even start my, my, my lesson in the day, I got to see, well, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how are, how's everyone doing? Let's do a mental health check. You know, my students is coming to class with trauma. You know, I got to address the trauma before I can, if I can teach you something, I got to at least check in on you. I got to, if I can check you, I got to at least check in on you first. So we got to keep that in mind as we continue on our journeys as teachers. 
It is to the strengths of reference are also really key of like, you know, speaking of trauma, I taught generational trauma, I was teaching the joy on the on the um, joy decor as well. And if you be they were able to understand kind of the discussions about generational trauma just from a simple two images of a concept of just giving them a frame of reference of today. Um, the depth and complexity icons are really good for helping students with close reading skills. Have them do that on themselves first. How have you emerged over time? Um, how do you, you know, what are your key details about yourself? And that can help students whenever they're trying to combat those tough, to, um, tough histories. Okay, can you, okay. Uh, um, can I just quickly thank you? Yeah. And all of the teachers here, I've been in the profession for 40 years. And whether you're in Florida and dealing with repression, literally, or whether you're in environments where maybe you have a little more freedom to go the route that you want to go, um, the end of my career is, is inspired by the beginning of yours. And thank you, every single person in here, so much. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. I know it's difficult to get students. Thank you for being here. I'm going to read because I had to write down the same thing you wrote. Okay. Can you just speak up so people can hear you? Uh, all right, yeah, yeah. All right. So, can you please say a little bit more about the relationship between content and pedagogy? Um, specifically, how are you all building coalitions across content areas? and your school site, district, or network, so that what education is imagined to be, and how learning and knowledge building happens is thought about differently. So I think about this for a couple of reasons. So um, as an English teacher, I had a lot of difficulty getting some of my fellow teachers across content areas to think about skills, which is why I, I harp on pedagogy program, right? Because for me, Yes, it's important to know what a metaphor or symbol is, but I'm far more interested in the labor that metaphors and symbols do in things like social studies textbooks, as uh, we learned earlier in the image of manifest destiny, right? That's doing a lot of work, right? So that's an analysis of evaluation, right? So how do you all do that? And then secondly, you know, I'm puzzling through and thinking through uh, sort of justice, um, and form of justice, Trauma-informed pedagogies, and all of the literature talks about the importance of working at a larger scale. This, it has to be structural, it has to be institutional, it cannot be at the classroom or local site, right? So I appreciate that you all are here, and I also wonder because I've been in your situation where I, I've been put up as an example of someone who does this thing well, right? But it doesn't spread. Like, how, how so, you know, I want to go back to Chris, I appreciate your. your Notes on organizing. I'm curious how you all are organizing, or how are you all trying to scale up the work that you're doing through content? I, I love that question because um, what I what I do. I'm an English teacher as well. I teach English uh, three, English four. I don't know why they gave me eleven, then twelve graders, but that's that's double homicide if you if you, got, if you know what teenagers are, you know you know how they think. What they do, um, but I do a lot of cross cross teaching. You know, I mean, you come to class, you're gonna learn English, you're gonna learn how to write, you're gonna learn how to critically read, but you're gonna learn history too. You're gonna learn math too because the, the, the generation different. Um, and I hope I'm answering your question with this because uh, you know a lot of a lot of, a lot of I'm speaking for my district. Like our teachers don't really focus in on those type of things and. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's complacency. I don't know what, what the problem is when it comes to the, 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 the work that we give our students. But if you if you don't take the opportunity or take the chance to elevate them, then man, I don't know who will. Um, you in your position for a reason. You the one that they use as an example for a reason. So you got to use your reasoning to to reach those kids. It's gonna you know one student at a time. One student at a time. Um, I, I believe that. You, know, you got to start small, you got to start somewhere, and the child needs you. That, that student in your classroom needs you. So if you can reach one student, you, you did your job. Right? You, did, you did everything you need to do. Uh, in terms of content and pedagogy or content versus pedagogy on a micro level, the difference is 
not too extreme, but there are times when some teachers, they might just know the content and they can say all the facts about Columbus and, and what happened, what transpired. And again, you know, that's great. They might have everything memorized and they want their kids to just memorize facts. The difference between just giving and delivering content, which is essentially just giving information, the making process, which students can find on their own in today's world in many, in many ways, is that pedagogy will take that existing information and utilize, teachers will utilize skills to not just get students to memorize information, but to analyze documents, to see a primary source and be able to actually source where the document's coming from, who's the audience, to contextualize it with what's going on, to corroborate it with existing documents, to essentially form their own perspectives, their own historical perspectives, similarly with historians do. So that essentially highlights the importance of pedagogical skills. And like Anthony said, there's a lot of cross collaboration with other teachers as well. So that brings in, you know, so much from English class and so much from various uh, humanities subjects. So on a micro level, pedagogy is, is, those skills are crucial because if not, again, we're doing our students an incredible disservice, especially during uh, an age of social media and misinformation. We have to teach them the skills in order to navigate this, this world that we're in. Um, and I'll just say, in terms of the pedagogy, I think for me, how I frame it, and I can only answer for like how I process it, for me, I usually um, do the backwards design, that's really important for me, and when I think about the projects that I want my students to do, I'm thinking about, I want them to be showcasing, I want them to be producing, I want them to be creating. Um, i just thinking back to my dear, dear friend, Natalia Braginsky, who did a walking tour of Haven that your students can go and walk on now, I brought my kids on it. A month ago. So while you're here, you might want to go ahead and take a look at it. Um, that was done in collaboration with teacher um, students. Um, my civil rights or my activist unit that I'm planning right now, the end goal is for my students to do an oral history with a modern day activist. Um, those are interdisciplinary skills and projects that, again, I'm then I'm not kind of like thinking I gotta teach them every little thing about the Black Power Movement, but I'm taking the skills that I need them to get to that final point. So you need to understand the purpose of strategy. You need to understand different perspectives and, and vice versa. And I think I'm just gonna do a quick little plug. As a, a member of the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective that we have here, um, it's also in terms of making your impact better. I've had the chance to work with dozens of teachers across the state. I teach in a teacher preparation program. It's really about learning and working with each other. Um, there's also a lot of gatekeeping in education. I'm like, I'm doing this really cool thing and I don't want to share it because I want the spotlight. And there's something really awesome about sharing and kind of collecting. So for example, we work together with dozens of teachers who are about to teach African-American and Latino history. We have a long list that I reference all the time of just teachers putting things on a Google Doc. This is what I'm taking a look at. This is what the resources that I'm looking at. And you'd be surprised because a lot of teachers who might seem kind of like ill-intentioned, like they just want to do one thing. It's just that they haven't seen other things and they don't know how to build up to that. And so providing as many opportunities is really what's going to help that spread and just organizing together. You know, we just had to fight back. And there's only so many of us right now. <laughs> just being honest. So we got to work together and support each other. That's the only way it's really going to happen. Well, uh, let me just plug the Anti-Racist Teaching and Learning Collective website. There is so much content on there and it links to um, so many different resources and um, learning circles and webinars and all kinds of stuff. So please take a look um, on there. I want to really quickly address the question about um, making it more systemic. And I, I know what you're saying, but I actually really believe, and I talked at the beginning about how I was initially interested in policy and then wanted to go into the classroom. And I really believe that all change is relational and that change actually, there are a lot of policy makers who are trying to make changes. This, I went to policy fellowship, and I hear a lot of policy makers who are like, makers who are like, well, we're trying to make this happen, but it doesn't happen in the classroom. So I do really think um, that um on some level change has to it has to be a dialectic right between the broad systemic issues and the the classrooms where the thing actually happens and so i want to talk a little bit about like this playground project that i did 
Um, for me, it was not just about getting a playground because my students were playing with a stress screwed in our empty field and that was horrifying. Um, it was about engaging the students in a, an extremely participatory democratic project. And they, like literally, the thing that is being built is as close to their design as I could possibly make it. They gave the presentation, the like final presentation to win that $1.5 million to make it. They worked with the architect, they told the professionals what to do, and we did research. Like I incorporated those skills, right? Um, those C3 skills. We were looking at maps of access to outdoor space and rates, right? We were visiting different neighborhoods and talking about the history of our neighborhood. And so one of the things I really believe is that like organizing within your school community for your kids, especially when your kids, there's so, so, so much that they deserve that they do not have. Um, that is one of the most powerful um, political projects teachers can take on because it teaches our kids to take on those projects, right? When we do it with them, not for them, but with them, with their families, then they know they can do it again because I can say, look, you got this. I wouldn't have gotten this by myself. You got this. And it's going to make a difference for years and years to come. Um. Um, we could continue having this conversation for, for such a long time as with all of the wonderful panels today, and I hope I look forward to the conversations tomorrow that are happening both in the panels and in the informal moments. Um, but for right now, please join me in giving a huge thanks to our <laughs> Uh, if you're a panelist of any, you've been a panelist, you want